February 14, 1942. World War II is raging. The United States Navy struggles viciously with Axis forces at sea as it tries to mobilize for war. Cities all over the country prepare to produce guns, tanks, planes, and ships. Evansville, Indiana, a struggling industrial city on the Ohio River, is one such city. Picking up a paper from the Courier and Press that morning, the people of Evansville began to buzz with excitement. A massive shipyard was to be built on a stretch of the river just south of Mead Johnson Nutrition and north of Southern Indiana Gas and Electric. The shipyard was to boast a staggering 10 dry docks and would be used to build dozens of specialty landing ships for the planned invasion of Europe. These boats were to be 300 feet long, 50 feet wide, and able to make ocean-going journeys with large amounts of equipment on board. Mayor Dress, in the magnitude of the moment, gave an address to the people of Evansville about the uncertain future of the city. At once, however, questions of labor supply and housing arise, which call on all our resources for immediate solution. As mayor, I want to assure the contractors and Naval Department that Evansville will solve their problems so that national defense can be expedited with no inconvenience to those who have seen fit to put confidence in our ability to do the job. We are entrusted with an industry that is new to us and our civic conduct toward this subject will be the measure of our worthiness. In this connection, I call upon every industry in Evansville and all our citizens to lend whatever aid is necessary to prove that in Evansville, it can be done. Within two weeks of the announcement, the Evansville Courier reported on the 27th of February a, quote, steady hum of activity. Hundreds of people previously out of work quickly made for the job office to get hired at the shipyard. On March 12th, preliminary construction began with roughly 70 workers making the first digs on the site. On June 25th, long before the yard itself was completed, the first LST was laid down. And finally, on October 25th, the yard was finished. The long job to win World War II had officially begun. Work on an LST at the shipyard was hazardous and chaotic. The noise of the shipyard was immense. Welding torches, clanging metal, yelling, and the movement of cranes, it all came together to create a near impenetrable sound barrier that no voice could reach. Um, a lot of people comment on the, the noise level. It was a, an incredibly noisy place to work, um, just with uh, oxyacetylene torches, welding torches, uh, various drills and, and cutters, and then the movement of cranes themselves, which would have been moving on rails, um, and some of these cranes were enormous. So these giant cranes moving, which had them, they also had warning signals as they were moving to, to alert people. So just a kind of cacophony of noise, if, if you can imagine that. Along with the noise, the temperature inside an LST during work was always extreme. When it was cold outside, it was freezing inside. And when it was hot, it was boiling. When it was cold, I'd have my pajamas on. I'd have the pair of slacks on, and I had my coveralls on, the green coveralls. And I'd have my leather gloves on and my welder's gloves on, and it was cold. The cramped conditions inside the LSTs themselves were a key factor in causing injuries. I busted my shins going through the compartments. I had nasty looking shins. Finally, I got me a pair of boots that went up to my knees. So if I hit the shins, it didn't hurt anymore like it did before. But I had bruised shins. I still got stars today from where I only have pretty legs like some of the girls. When a ship was launched, most activity at the dry docks halted, and workers would try to get a good view of the ships as they slid down the ramp. 
But I think the launching of the ships is a, is a really interesting part of the story. The, so the very first LST was, was started in June of 1942. It was launched on October 31st, uh, Halloween of, of 1942. So that first one took quite a long time, several months. Uh, and that first launching was a huge deal. And there, you can see from photographs, there's workers hanging on, the, uh, on every available bit of scaffolding to watch what's happening. And then uh, all of the launches that followed kind of followed the same pattern where people would stop and gather. Uh, invitations were sent out to, to guests. You needed tickets to get in. And when you, when you got in, there were various dignitaries would be up on the, the, the launching platform. And traditionally, of course, ships are launched with a bottle of champagne, and the, the tradition is that it's always a woman. So to my knowledge, it always was a woman. There's lots of photos of these well-dressed ladies about to throw the champagne bottle. However, life was not always a party at the shipyard. The dangerous environment within presented a clear problem as early as December of 1941. Before construction even began, many warnings were posted about the threat of injury and posters were put up to raise awareness about workplace safety when work began. Eye injuries were the most common injury at the yard. 55% of all injuries were to the eyes. Wear your goggles was the mantra of safety officials and was common to see on posters around the yard. Also prevalent was the threat of disease. Vincent's disease, a respiratory infection very similar to the flu, ran rampant around the working population throughout the war. Security at the shipyard, despite its location, was very tight. Guard towers, barbed wire, security checkpoints, and identification documents were all employed to keep the shipyard safe from saboteurs and spies. Workers were encouraged to never speak about what they were doing at the yard or what was being assembled there, and their work was kept so secret due to their importance to the war effort. So the federal government took real care to make sure that security was maintained at the yard, and that included a no-go zone on, on Wrights Hill and an area on Wrights Hill where you could go, but you weren't allowed to have a camera. And then there was, people were checked on their way in and out of the yard. There were guards, there were guard towers, there was wire. And then there was also a security boundary on the river itself. So there was an area of the river where boats were not allowed to sail. To, so effectively a, a, a ring around the shipyard protecting it. And I think the risk was always, this was a brand new weapon effectively. The LST had, had just been invented. And the, the idea was that the longer that you could keep these things secret, the better. And then any modifications, obviously, they would want to keep that secret as well. Throughout the war, over 70,000 people walked through the gates of the Evansville shipyard and worked hard to produce 167 LSTs. In 1944, the shipyard managed to launch 99 LSTs, one every four days. It was an immense achievement in our city's history, and those who worked there are very proud of their important, albeit dangerous, work. Unfortunately, in 1946, a fire struck the yard and destroyed a good portion of the property. In the aftermath, the yard was slowly chipped away at until it was finally sold off and documents for the yard were destroyed. Today, the property serves as a grain dumping station and the parking lot behind Mead Johnson Nutrition's building on the west side. All that remains is a small plaque marking where the yard once was and one of the old gantry cranes. These remnants are a monument to what our city accomplished in those crucial years and to what the future may hold for Evansville and her industry.
This has been an F.J. Wright's Feel the History production.